so I should uh, first of all thank the the organizing committee for for having me and for assembling such a, a stimulating series of talks. Um, I especially thank them for allowing me to present because I think this uh, research on colonial New England pushes our temporal and geographic bounds, but hopefully in, in fruitful ways. I think that only recently we're beginning to realize the fruits of student notes in early America, of which they're plentiful, as well as the enduring Renaissance practices of note taking on newer shores. Um, many of these notes are in shorthand, and that is perhaps the greatest Renaissance scribal technology in the English speaking world. So now on to my uh, talk. When the famed Czech pedagogue Jan Amos Komenius made a trip to England in the early 17th century, he was stunned. Writing with exasperation to a friend in Poland about the English classroom, Komenius marveled in Latin at English shorthand. The good part of children and men captures up speeches with the pen, in fact, to the word. Even among rustic men, the art of tachygraphy is popular, which they call stenography by which art hands imitate the speed of the tongue. Here was shorthand, seemingly everywhere and in every way worthy of marvel. A favorite anecdote among early modern English book historians, this recollection of Comenius's has provided positive proof about the utility, reverence, and respect for stenographic modes of writing in early modern England. But, like most tales that we habitually tell and retell, there are important elements to this account that have gone overlooked. While the Czech traveler emphasizes shorthand's widespread use, it is precisely in the context of the school and in the company of students that the scribal art seemed to function best. Comenius, I believe, was not wrong. Though we tend to associate shorthand with legal and administrative spheres, Arguably the largest group of shorthand users in the early modern period was students. Following in the footsteps of Comenius, my paper today will attempt to look over the shoulder of the hordes of early modern students, in my case, New England students, who found that shorthand offered them a unique tool to excel in their academic and social surroundings. Given that we are all asked to focus on methodological questions, I've structured this presentation around the two most straightforward and important questions for the study of student shorthand notes. First and fundamentally, how do we make sense of shorthand? And second, perhaps more importantly, why would we want to study student shorthand notes? So let's begin with the first question. To understand stenography, we must know first something of its origins. The history of shorthand is a long one. Easily dating back to antiquity and stretching up to the very present day, shorthand has captured the attention of many historical note takers. In his life of Cato the Younger, first century historian Plutarch credits Cicero with promulgating the practice. Pliny, meanwhile, author of a massive ancient encyclopedia on natural history, further attests to Cicero's fascination with commendious penmanship. Keenness of sight, has achieved instances transcending belief in the highest degree. Cicero records that a parchment copy of Homer's poem, the Iliad, was enclosed in a nutshell. Now, whether or not we are to trust this nutty parable remains open for debate. It is clear though, that abbreviated writing caught the attention of other classical writers, as Seneca, Manilius, and Marshall likewise praised how the pen could outpace the tongue. In the late antique and medieval period, various forms of sh shorthand, tachygraphy in the Byzantine world or Tyronean notes in the medieval West remained in use among specialized circles of scribes. The heyday of English shorthand only arrived at the end of the 16th century and fascination with the scribal technology spread like wildfire. What shorthand offered was not so much a means to manage oral information but a manner to master it entirely. As James Fleming aptly puts it, if longhand notes were an attempt to gather the fruits from a discourse, charactery, another word for shorthand, was an attempt to pluck up the whole tree. In that sense, it was actually an entirely different kind of writing technology from longhand note-taking. 
One of the first shorthand manuals published in the newly formed United States of America similarly professed, lo, here a line confines the Tully's rage or Livy's empire stretches half a page. Early modern historical actors, including and especially students, remained infatuated with shorthand, ever eager to get their hands on the latest shorthand manual, like the youth of today are eager to make sure they possess the latest iPhone, no matter how minute these updates might actually be. During the 17th and 18th centuries, at least 100 different English men authored works on shorthand. A famed manual could, in the span of a few decades, proudly profess its 55th edition. Early modern English and early American historians are left with thousands upon thousands of pages of student shorthand notes, but a distinct problem, how to actually read them. The prevailing method is simply to ignore them. Even in the supposedly comprehensive founding fathers papers um, that appear in the mid 20th century, shorthand rarely ever makes the cut. Those that have been more ambitious in making sense of shorthand have not often been very successful. For making sense of shorthand almost invariably means making sense of seeming nonsense. A search through colonial archives not only turns up plentiful examples of shorthand, but likewise myriad instances of scholarly desperation. A note from an early 19th century researcher trying to read shorthand was less than sanguine. After considerable labor, I despair of being able to decipher the shorthand minutes of the conference without other help than this book alone affords. At best, it is bad chirography. Faced with the seeming incomprehensibility of student shorthand, early American historians have by and large accepted that shorthand is in fact a secret a technique students and adults alike used to shield their inner thoughts from outer eyes. A recent iteration of this secrecy interpretation was the decoding of a manuscript of Roger Williams, whereupon journalists, following the lead of historians, I may add, equated shorthand with the Da Vinci Code. This regnant historiographic reading of shorthand, in my opinion, is not only historically inaccurate, but analytically unhelpful. Inaccurate because shorthand was so wide and so common at colonial American and early modern English colleges that it could not have functioned well as a secret script. Unhelpful because it relieves us of the burden of actually reading these shorthand manuscripts that clutter our archives. I want to emphasize today that with enough time, toil, and perhaps also ibuprofen, we can actually train ourselves to read student shorthand. I cannot here get bogged down too much in technical detail, but of course I'm willing to entertain any and all questions after the talk. But I want to offer a few guiding suggestions for the explorer of history brave enough to greet the monsters that are shorthand manuscripts face to face. First and foremost, the best way to learn early modern shorthand from the vantage point of the modern day is to read the 17th and 18th century manuals themselves. This seems like an obvious suggestion, but recall the sheer quantity and variety of manuals I mentioned. How to know which method to master? I should say that you probably won't go wrong with any. Much scholarship in my view has overemphasized the differences between methods and the individual adaptations that users implemented. Studying one method, in my belief any method, can provide the rudimentary tools to understand most methods. That being said, there are more specific methodologies available to today's researchers. Like most note-taking practices, shorthand could only ever be learned by practice, and practice shorthand students did. Contained in colonial college archives, are myriad manuscript copies of shorthand manuals copied out and passed down by students throughout the 17th and 18th centuries. Studying these manuscripts, these manuscript manuals offers an even more direct line of access into making sense of the scribal nonsense that is shorthand. 
Stenographic styles went through certain fads and students often taught one another the very same methods. Tracing and recreating their, educa their educational process can in turn educate us enough to read student shorthand. Other aids also exist. Some students may note to themselves of new shorthand symbols or hear abbreviations that they introduced. For other note takers, the information management was at a larger structural level. A set of six quarto volumes of shorthand notes on New England sermons in the mid 18th century pictured here includes rich detailed indexes to each volume, as well as contemporary numbering of the notebooks as a contained collection. In the 16th notebook, an uh, indication of the sheer uh, quantity we have here, the index even contains a contemporary key to the shorthand alphabet, pictured here on the right. These keys are actually fairly common. Student auditors attempted to render their notes legible as much as for themselves as for others. In fact, many shorthand note takers look to a future beyond themselves, passing down brimming notebooks to family members and peers. Absent a key in a manual, uh, and should students employ one of these less commonly practiced types of shorthand, it is best to turn to some aids prepared by practicing stenographers in the 19th century. While 19th century stenographers generally look with disdain upon early modern shorthand as they triumph their own methods, um, Gregg and Pittman shorthand that are actually still used today, they were interested in systematizing how early forms of stenography functioned. In the reference works these 19th century practitioners prepared, there appear wonderful charts that alert you to the different alphabets across shorthand styles. Works like these, I'm cautiously optimistic, may not, help, may not only help the historian better understand shorthand, but computers too. We are still in the beginning stages of implementing handwritten text recognition for shorthand, but there are a number of projects currently ongoing that are attempting to use machine learning and neural networks to decode shorthand manuscripts. One of the obstacles for this type of research, however, is that these neural networks need a large training set on the order of hundreds of thousands of words of shorthand and longhand equivalents. We simply do not have many such examples in database, databases already fabricated. Now, Making sense of student shorthand does not mean that we should in fact do so. Herein, I would like to address the second question I posed at the beginning of this presentation. Why would we want to study student shorthand notes? At the risk of appearing in a an iconoclast today, I will say personally that I find it worth reminding myself that studying student notes cannot be an end in and of itself. In order for this largely technical and time-consuming endeavor to be ultimately worth it, the researcher of student notes must never forget that the fruits of his or her labors have to transcend an individual student, a particular manuscript, or a specific institution. Indeed, this larger so what question of student shorthand notes has followed me since my work on the topic during my master's at the University of Groningen. My thesis on student shorthand in colonial New England, I was surprised to learn earlier this year, earned an award from the Royal Dutch Academy of Arts and Sciences. The jury of the Academy, it seems, was also surprised. With characteristic Dutch directness, which I've grown to appreciate over three years spent living in the Netherlands, the laudatio from the jury began, this thesis has a large surprise factor. Its subject matter is shorthand note-taking among students in 18th century. Shorthand, students, in colonial New England? At first sight, this might seem like a niche topic and perhaps even quite a dull topic. Why would we want to learn more about that? Many pleasantries followed uh, in Dutch and I would say the oration was quite positive overall, but the speech ended as it began an often used qualification for a new historical research project is that it covers a phenomenon which until then had not yet received enough attention. One can be quite skeptical about these kinds of claims. The fact that something has not been researched does not in itself make it interesting. Perhaps there was good reason for the lack of earlier research. 
Now this framing, this doubting from the jury, and dare I say, initial skepticism about studying student notes actually captures well some of my own lurking concerns. We must always ask ourselves what a set of student notes can reveal about students more broadly, or better yet, about the knowledge cultures and practices of a society. A, consider a consideration of student shorthand, I argue, not only provides a more vivid glimpse into the understudied history of shorthand, but also a new understanding of early American students themselves. After all, 17th and 18th century students tend to get a bad rap in scholarship, which in the American context routinely characterizes the colonial people as a pitiable fellow. Someone force fed the dry pabulum of a curriculum he had little cho choice over and even littler interest in. Histories of education in the American context tend to be so broadly focused pursued at such high altitudes that they miss the details on the ground. While valuable in many respects, these narratives have casted the colonial college as a feeble antiquated dinosaur that must go extinct for the rise of the modern democratic university. A consideration of shorthand practices goes a long way towards deconstructing this enduring yet misguided image of the early school. Colonial students actually valued much of their college education including and especially the circuit of sermons they honed their shorthand skills for, dutifully recorded and organized into brimming manuscript repositories of knowledge that they, consult, they, they consulted for decades to come. Studying practice like, practices like shorthand, tracing the ways in which students developed and mastered skills on their own, generates a radically new understanding of early students as knowledge producers in a colonial world that respected and even empowered their intellectual autonomy. Isolating an overlap aspect of the colonial student's intellectual world, shorthand, and sticking close to the sources offers the opportunity to pay new attention to early practices of pen and mind. It goes without saying that there's more work to be done here. Tens of thousands of pages of shorthand student notes remained unexamined. Like the early modern Europeanist, early Americanists are forced to dive into that messy mass of reading and writing. And yet I find that this plunge is ultimately worth it. For when in efforts to catch our historical breath, we lift our heads above the manuscript depths, we perceive larger vistas, a brighter, clearer image of the historical student emerges. We begin to witness the modest pupil as an important facilitator of knowledge production a self-starting student and teacher, a propagator of the latest scribal technologies. Knowledge does not just trickle down from old to young. In many cases, it was students who enabled and pioneered their own intellectual, spiritual, and scribal worlds. I thank you for your intention and look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Teddy, for this wonderful lecture. You have convinced me uh, we should all uh, start studying the shorthand uh, notes. Um, but I wonder how steep the learning curve is, is to get it in, in, in your fingers, this, this, uh, because it looks uh, terrifying to me. <laughs> um, but I wonder whether there are any questions from the audience. Uh, Daniel has one. Yeah, um, did, did I understand you correctly? Did you say that um, uh, students in colonial America also um, took notes on sermons um, in the church? Because um, I know that's a phenomenon that you can also find in, um, yeah, beginning with the Reformation and Wittenberg and a lot of the other Protestant schools that, um, yeah, the students or even the school kids like Johann Gerhard, which I mentioned, um, part of their theological education was to attend the church services and to take notes. And uh, can you say a little bit more about this um, practice and what time period you're talking about exactly? And how, met, how much is, uh, has survived from these notes? Because they're very rare here in, in 16th century Germany. Mm -hmm. Great question. So um, certainly, so this this culture of um, 
sermon note taking, especially in the product Protestant context uh, is very vibrant in, in colonial New England. And we can trace this from the, the beginning in the, the 1630s and 40s. Um, the first uh, settlers who come over, for instance, Thomas Shepard from England uh, in his autobiography, he talks about his student days at Cambridge and how sort of troubled he was that he couldn't um, take notes fast enough to keep up with the sermon. But God uh, grant, had an intervention and granted him this new ability, which was shorthand. And it continued. Um, it, it, I think there's great continuity all the way um, throughout the, the, the 18th century. And we have just um, um, such a, a great magnitude of, of student notes. I, I really think um, I said thousands, I, I'll probably in the order of um, 10 or 20,000 that I've looked at. I have a, um, a, a preliminary census of student shorthand notes that I'm uh, um, currently uh, pursuing publication. Um, and I've also uh, transcribed and sort of translated, if you will, some of these. But the difference between the, the English world and, and, and the, the sort of, um, the I guess, the German speaking world, um, I think is great here. There's, there's something um, about shorthand that is really prominent in the early modern English speaking world. And the sort of um, million dollar question for, for the, the early modern uh, linguist is why it was an English uh, phenomenon. And I can say they're great uh, friends and colleagues of mine for, uh, for instance, um, Kelly McKay at, uh, at Harvard, uh, who I, I'm confident will, will answer this question in, in a few um, years. Yeah, um, thank you. Is it um, is that information published anywhere about the taking notes on sermons in colonial America? Yes. Yeah, so um, that the the um, uh, the main work I would suggest is the the New England Soul by uh, Harry uh, Stout, and he looks at. Um, uh, he looks at mainly actually preacher notes, but he uh, spends a lot of time, I think he spent 15 years looking at manuscript uh, sermon notes and uh, sort of deconstructing the, the Perry Miller narrative of, of religious declension. So I would say Harry Stout is, is the best place to look. Oh, okay. Like one last Mary note, um, uh, Georg Rura was commissioned to copy down the, the sermons that uh, Luther held um, in the beginning of the um, 1530s, I think he also um, developed his own type of stenography, just as a comment to end. Yeah. yeah. And um, I should, yeah, I also had uh, uh, definitely right now, uh, um, Anne reminded me of, certainly of someone we shouldn't forget, Meredith Newman, Jeremiah Scribes is also a very recent, uh, very wonderful book on, uh, on uh, taking notes on sermons. Um, um, she, she talks a little bit about shorthand, but she mainly looks at longhand notes. And she also has a great blog where she uh, um, has a collaborative process of transcribing uh, uh, notes, uh, including some student notes. OK, thank you very much. Um, are there any other uh, questions? Um, I was myself struck by, by the Greek. I'm all, always interested in the Greek. <laughs> um, so I was wondering how common is this that there are Greek symbols uh, or is it mainly ad hoc as the Philadelphia case suggests? I think it's, I think it's more the, the latter. It's really ad hoc. Um, um, as, as, as time goes by uh, for in, the, in the 17th century and into the 18th century, this sort of expectations I think ratchet up on what like a new shorthand method is supposed to allow you to do. And so I see in the 18th century, some students uh, copying out manuals that um, that promise that you could use shorthand for Greek, uh, for Latin, even for Dutch, uh, they, they, they say. Um, I uh, frankly haven't seen uh, examples uh, of this, but again, you know, there's, you know, there's tens of thousands of pages that I haven't, um, I haven't decoded so so um, we, we could uh, find some, some examples possibly. Yeah, that would be very interesting. Yeah. And I was also wondering um, to what extent can you regard the shorthand as a kind of way of, of pushing abbreviations to to the end. So is it can, can we regard this as a continuum from writing everything in full to stenography or is there really a separate character uh, that stenography has that so we should not put it in this continuum so I would, I'm wondering about this. That's a great question. Um, there is this tension and I've talked with I mentioned Kelly I've talked with Kelly a lot about this 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 tension in um, 
in shorthand manuals, whether the goal really is to capture verbatim every, sing every single thing that is said. And um, in sort of, you know, prefatory paratext and, and marketing materials, they, they, do, they do say that. But when you actually begin to read the manuals, they're a lot more realistic. And so um, this is something where I'd be, inter I think, um, uh, I'd be interested to hear what Ray maybe thinks that there's, they want you, they want the student to listen to what is being said and not just transcribe it as they hear it, but sort of uh, change it into phonetic uh, writing and even substitute out long words for short words. And so there's a lot of like, I think there's a lot of cognitive um, uh, energy that's really happening. You're not sort of just a, a tape recorder. You're really trying to sort of convert this, this oral experience into something that's chopped up and like manageable. Um, so I think there's a lot of, uh, um, a lot more we can do like thinking about how this process actually works in the student's mind. And that's a very good point. Uh, I think that would be a very fruitful uh, pathway to, to consider further. But in the meantime, there's a question by Yarik, who also wrote something in the chat about Leuven student notes from ser on, on sermons. Um, yes, so there's, I just wanted to say that there's some that we found some of the um, notes on sermons for uh, Leuven as well. So for a Catholic um, well, city, because it's not really in the context context of the university, but it's in the context of the Jesuit college. But these don't really have a lot of abbreviations. So I think they are second order notes on these sermons as well. Great, I'd love to see some of the, those references and contextualize yeah, this practice across uh, early America and early modern Europe, that'd be great. Okay, and we have even more questions coming in. Uh, three, no less. Uh, let's start with Elizabeth. She's first in line. Thank you very much. Uh, you might have mentioned this, but I was just wondering about how much this has to do with actually the sound of the language and whether you find a lot of, um, I, I you sort of just mentioned that in, in the um, reference to your last uh, question, but I wondered how do you ever find it that the shorthand used to abbreviate something written, or is it very much linked to an oral, ex as an oral, as in listening experience? Um, because I think that it is also almost like notation in some ways, a representation of something you hear, and and that's a different thought process than other ways. And I wonder whether that's um, an, an avenue to pursue, or you've looked at it too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, I think that is an exciting line of research. Um, also sort of yeah, a print culture of shorthand. Um, I know there's some people who are looking at sort of failed efforts to create um, uh, widespread print in shorthand. There are, there are books uh, that appear with sort of the Lord's Prayer or the Bible in, in shorthand. And so you're sort of reading this, you're not sort of transcribing, it's already done for you. Um, I also think it's didactic. It shows you that, you know, this can all actually be applied to, to your life, but um, um but yeah, I mean, I, I think there, this is a, a line of research that can be fruitfully pursued and would be well worth it. Great, thanks for that. Uh, we can move on to David, who's next in line. Yeah, thank you very much. This is uh, probably going to seem uh, a bit odd and from left field, but nonetheless, I just wanted to raise the question of whether it might be useful to think about student notes in general and, and yours in particular, thinking about modern theory or manuals of uh, writing shorthand. It had never occurred to me before, <laughs> to be honest. But, uh, is there anything behind the modern training in shorthand for people who still do that? And there are still people who do that. Um, that might be applicable in some way to thinking about how students in the early modern period or listeners in the early modern period took down notes. Yes, I think that's a great um, um, comment and, and thought that you know, shorthand still continues. And I think uh, I've sort of gone down the rabbit hole of watching uh, YouTube competitions that are held every year. And I think in Vegas of the fastest court stenographer, um, they're terribly boring uh, competitions, I might add. Um, but they type, yeah, they, or they, they can practice shorthand and transcribe 250, 275 words a minute. Um, 
I think there is there is a great opportunity between connecting this historical research with practitioners. And so a lot of 19th century uh, practitioners of shorthand were really interested in, in the history of shorthand and making connections and charting out how it changed. Um, and some of the, in my opinion, best works on shorthand are actually left unpublished. They're sort of buried in these archives of 19th century stenographers. There's one at uh, the Yale archives and there's one at the New York Public Library. Uh, and we haven't sort of combed through these, but I think there there is um, a lot that can be gained by thinking about this connection between modern day practice or trying to maybe learn ourselves how to do shorthand and then reimagining uh, how this note-taking worked at the student level. Um, I've sort of taught myself to read some, some shorthand and, and tried very uh, desultory uh, way to, to, to write some shorthand. I think I have a long way to go. Um, and perhaps only a couple of us uh, today that uh, are sort of um, daring enough to pursue that. But I think that there could be uh, new insights that emerge that way. So let me press you, uh, what insights emerge? Well, I think, I, I think this, um, the, the tension I mentioned earlier between trying to transcribe word for word and then trying to accommodate and substitute. Um, so, um, for instance, practicing stenographers at the, in the late 18th century in the Constitutional Congresses um, uh, for the newly formed United States, they were all competing to, to generate different transcriptions. And they were different transcriptions. And the, the, the stenographer owned the copyright to his, his version. And they tried to make it different. So I think um, understanding the ways in which stenographers have um, uh, an influence and, and maybe deconstructing the idea that these are verbatim, that there's a lot of creativity allowed. And I think we could probably understand that if we're sort of struggling to take down a, a, a speech, we would probably employ some of our own creativity and shortcuts and substitutions. And I think that could be really helpful to understand. Okay, great. And then our last question maybe for Ray. Um, hi, Teddy. Um, just one thought and maybe continuing David's, um, <clears throat> David's uh, line of, uh, of thought. Maybe we should actually take this to the test and, and put, um, this sounds like a, a beautiful ex cognitive experiment because people can, people actually do design artificial languages and try to put undergrads into fMRIs and learn stuff from that. And I actually have, I, I was just like, as he was speaking, I have a colleague at Edinburgh, and we really need to like try and take more genetic studies to an experimental kind of ground, like actually see what goes on when you do this on people. And yeah, so just a thought, about, and because of this is a methodological workshop, so I'm like thinking about how can you take this to another, like to the next level, to actually start doing experiments on undergrads in Edinburgh and see what happens. So that's just a that's a great suggestion. I think that would be really fun. I've definitely, um, I've seen some of this in the, the history of science recently, people like William Newman, uh, they'll um, show that early modern alchemy wasn't just these sort of cuckoo theories by actually, you know, performing some of the experiments in front of the audience and you get to see Diana's tree and things grow. Um, so it's sort of torturing our undergraduates in that way with shorthand <laughs> might be a fun, uh, yeah, fun exercise. Okay, Anne wants to add something? Yeah, if I could just add yeah, that you'll sure. definitely need permission from uh, <laughs> for using human subjects on that. And uh, I'll mention later, I tried with uh, a bunch of willing um, co-note uh, takers to take notes as a team, uh, as described in Hala. Um, and it was actually very difficult to understand what the speaker was saying while I was so busy trying to record each of the sentence segments in full text, um, and then I would hand it off to the next person. So we did, I think, roughly reconstruct the text, but I felt I had not understood what was going on. And we halted the experiment in time to basically get the punchline from the talk that we were doing that on. So I think it's it's a great idea. Um, and it might not, it might not be as easy as you think. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and on that note, um, I suggest we keep it at this.